And this, we're back to the schedule we had before. Last week I did silence and solitude because I sort of wanted to deal with that before we got to today's section. Um, and so this, this is the schedule as we now have it. Silence and solitude we did last week, worship and confession. Next week we will deal with simplicity and stewardship. And then the eighth week, conclusion, practicing the disciplines. And I may pick up a couple of things that I didn't, you know, that I skipped over simply because it was too much content. I mean, talk about journaling a little bit, for instance. And then we will have the final exam. <laughs> now, next week, I will give you the what you need to know about the spiritual disciplines um, study sheet. Those of you who were in classes the last term know what I mean by that. All three of the classes next week, I hope I get it all done. We, I will give to you, here's all the things you need to know. When it comes time for the exam, you don't have to take the exam if you're not taking the class for credit. This is for people who want to get a certificate or a degree out of this. Uh, I encourage you to do it anyway because studying the material and practicing and taking the exam um, would be, it will be an advantage to you because it will help you learn it. Now, let me ask you, did anybody who was in last last term who took the test, did anybody die from that? <laughs> Were there any major wounds here. in flight? Like, they're not here now. They, yeah. just, they just feel like that. They they're just feel like that. Now, honestly, I will give you a document next week which will tell you everything that will be on the test, everything you need to know. It really is a summary sheet of everything of significance in the class. If you know that material, you will do well. The vast majority of people in all three classes last term made 90% or better. Okay, In fact, probably 80% of the people may 90% or better on the test. It's really not hard. I'll tell you what you need to know. You'll get those documents next week, all right? Um, and then we'll the second hour of uh, the eighth week, two weeks from now, we will do the final exam, okay? So today we're talking about worship. What is worship? It's very hard to define worship in a way that's really satisfying because it, it, it can be approached in different ways. For some people, worship means going to church on Sunday morning. For some, a subset of those people, worship means just the singing part on Sunday morning. Uh, it's, it, it, I really have a problem with the fact that so many people today, when they talk about the worship time in church, they mean when, they, when they're singing, because that affects them emotionally. Well, everything we do on Sunday morning should be worship, if we understand worship correctly. And in fact, we should be worshiping seven days a week. Let me give you this definition of worship, and then we'll talk about it. <clears throat> worship means to ascribe the proper worth to God. The word worship literally comes from worth-ship, which was a Saxon word. Okay? Um, to ascribe the proper worth to God, to acknowledge that He is worthy of praise, and to approach and address God as worthy of all glory and honor. It means saying to God, you are a great God. It means praising Him, and praising God is like praising anybody else. You did, you did a wonderful job in creating this universe, Lord. You, you are so good to me. You are so gracious to me. You are a great and loving God. I am just amazed at your mercy and your grace to me. That's what it means to praise God. That means, that's what it means to, sh to express that God is worthy. So, worship is to come before God in relationship and declare to Him, to His face, so to speak, that He is worthy of your praise, and to praise Him, and to thank Him. And we're going to talk about various aspects of that as we go along today. Um, it's important to note that while I said that praising God is like praising a person, telling them the things they've done that are wonderful, or the things they've done really well, or the things you appreciate about them, that's what praising God is, is just like a person. And yet... God alone is truly worthy of that kind of praise. Every other person that we can praise for things they've done or who they are or what they mean to us, still, you know, there's limitation there. And yet for God, God is truly worthy of all praise. It is not insignificant that in Scripture, like in the book of Revelation, for instance, it happens most often, uh, and we're going to look at a couple of examples of that, every time any being appears before the Lord God, they fall down before him and worship him. It's almost as though you can't help it once you really experience the presence of God. That's what worship's about. We got room up there, Tina. And it's not the spray zone, no matter what my wife says. Okay. Now it's worth noting that Christianity is quite unique amongst religions in the world. Hello. Uh, in that. Uh, 
uh, Christianity calls for us to have a personal and intimate relationship with God. There's no other religion in which that's truly the case. Now, in Islam, for instance, they believe that there is one God, but God is seen as a as such a transcendent being, you're not expected to be able to have a relationship with them. They don't have the sense of eminence that we have. You know, transcendence, God is different than us. Eminence, God is close to us. He's made himself available. Christianity is pretty much alone in all the religions of the world in that it calls for us to have a personal and an intimate relationship with God. In fact, the very core of our Christian faith should be built upon us having a personal interaction with God, our Creator. Not just for the for the purpose of salvation, so that we can be saved by saying we, you know, we believe. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you, you will be saved. So you can be saved if you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, if you believe that he is the Lord of the universe. But we have not only an obligation, but a response, and that's salvation, but we have an obligation and an opportunity far beyond that where we can be in a relationship with God, that we can celebrate that personal relationship with God on an ongoing basis as we acknowledge God's Lordship, His divinity, as we express our intimate relationship with Him and grow in that. That's what worship really is. Now, um, worship happens whenever, this is sort of a summing up of that, whenever we intentionally cherish God and we, and we value him above everything else in our lives. Again, so many people think that worship is what happens on Sunday morning for an hour or even just the song time during Sunday morning hour. Uh, as I said before, we as Christians should be worshiping all the time because it is the expression of our relationship with God. And we should be experiencing and practicing and, uh, and developing our intimate relationship with God all the time. We'll talk about that as we go along. Any questions about that definition? I want to give you a couple of examples from Scripture. Okay, Two beautiful examples, I think, both from Revelation. Revelation 5. Those before the throne of God in heaven say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. This is an example of what it means to worship God from the book of Revelation. Our worship of God needs to look more like that than it probably does now. When you even talk about saying these words to God, some of you are feeling uncomfortable about that. And yet, that's what worship is. It is to praise God for His greatness, for His, his, his being Creator, for His mercy, for His grace. It is to tell God we thank Him. And I'm going to talk about some things like gratitude a little bit later as part of worship. But this is what worship looks like. And from also from Revelation, a chapter earlier, Revelation 4, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. This is what worship means. To praise God. In fact, worshiping God really has two sides. We worship God for who he is. The great and powerful God. But we also worship him for what he does. That he made us. That he made all the world. All the universe. And that he has saved us. Um, I've talked before in classes that the two great pillars on which our faith in God is built is the fact that God is a creator, so creation, and then he redeemed us. He's our redeemer. Redemption, like the two pillars of a, of a suspension bridge. Earl Palmer, our pastor in, in, from Seattle, has talked about that. The two pillars on which everything else hangs is the fact that God is our creator and he is our redeemer. We praise him for what he has done for us in creating us and in redeeming us as well as the fact that he is the one true God that we can worship. So who he is and what he has done. And it's important to note that worship has to happen from the inside out. And it should happen all the time. As I said, um, it, in fact, even when we come to Sunday morning to worship, or Sunday night, or whenever you have worship service, 
We need to understand. Some people think, okay, I'm in the church. We're doing this, this church thing for an hour. That's worship. Well, it's not if your heart is closed. Because corporate worship is a gathering of individual people who open their hearts to God and worship Him. You don't, you don't worship as a clump. We worship as individuals, but there is great, there's great joy and even great power in worshiping individually together. You see what I mean? But still, worship, worship happens when individuals open their hearts to the Lord. We can do that in corporate worship. But even in corporate worship, it really is a combination of many people who individually are opening their hearts and worshiping God. Right? Um, and again, we can't believe that just because on a given, given day we show up in a particular specialized building that worship is happening. It's not. And I think some people are sadly mistaken about that. Now, it's also important to note Human beings are made for worship. We are created to worship. So much so that I think we can say everyone alive, every human being worships someone or something. We all have something we worship. It's built in. We're hardwired to do that. We cannot help but assign some kind of ultimate value and worth to someone or something in our lives. Um, my man, G.K. Chesterton, said this in The Everlasting Man. The crux and crisis is that man found it natural to worship, even natural to worship unnatural things. <laughs> if man cannot pray, he is gagged. If he cannot kneel, he is, he is in irons. That means that frequently we worship things that don't deserve our worship. We worship our house, or our garden, or our you know, investments, or our whatever it is. Um, and we think that that somehow is going to give us satisfaction, or we worship our family, our children. That that's going to be the thing that gives us the satisfaction of our heart. But the fact is that those are all, while they may be gifts of God themselves, may they be, while they may be worthy, they're secondary things. And secondary things in our lives can never satisfy our primary longing, which is for a relationship with God. There is... Um, as Pascal said, a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. Nothing else can fill that vacuum. Only true worship of God, true relationship, which leads to worship of God, will fill that vacuum. Nothing else will do it, even though we try. Only a love relationship with our Creator will satisfy that longing. Um, Ruth Haley Barton said, Your desire for God and your capacity to connect with God as a human soul is the essence of who you are. It is why you were created. We were made in the image of God because we were made for the purpose of relationship with God. And if we do not have that relationship with God, we will always sense that something is wrong. Something is broken. Something is missing. I've said many times already, there has never been a society in human history that we've identified that has not had a basic belief of some kind that there's something wrong with us. There is something broken in us. There is something missing in humanity. Well, that something is that we are separated from God by sin. Yet we were made for a relationship with that, and something inside us, inside us knows that that's wrong. And we seek to fill that emptiness, that void. But we look in the wrong places. As Chesterton said, we, you know, it's natural to worship, but we will worship unnatural things because we get it wrong. We are mistaken about how we need to approach this. Okay? Uh, one writer has said that true worship is an invitation by God to dance with the Trinity, to be in in communication, in relationship, and motion with the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are invited to the dance. And we are missing it. Inside we know we are missing it until we accept the invitation of the dance. Because it is an invitation from God. You know, He invites us to be in relationship with Him. He invites us to be in a, in, in a relationship of worship with Him. Now, um, because it is necessary for human beings to worship something. And I believe everyone does, whether they know it or not. I'll give you a couple of other quotes here. Uh, Martin Luther said, our Lutherans aren't, aren't down front today. Well, we got a couple of Lutheratarians in the middle. Uh, <laughs> we call them Lutheratarians if they're members of our church and they're originally Luther. So, Luther said, whatever your heart clings to and relies upon, that is properly your God. 
goes back to the idea that everybody worships something. Worship is something that is found in the lives of even the most hardened secularists, agnostics, and atheists. We all worship something. There is something that we try to uh, identify, again, even if we're not conscious of it, as giving us <coughs> ultimate value or meaning in our lives. And because what we because we may worship something that's not God, what we worship frequently reveals to us what we truly value most. What we worship identifies or reveals what we value most. What we love, what we adore, what we focus on, what we worship forms us into who we are. And if that is not God, then it makes us into something that is, not, that is less than the image of God. We talk about that this is a pursuit of godliness. We desire to be more like Jesus. If we worship something that is not God, then we become less like Jesus, less in the image of God, by our own choice. Uh, uh, Louis Giglio, who is a pastor from Atlanta, a church in Atlanta, writes this. So how do you know where and what you worship? It's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your loyalty. At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne, and whatever or whomever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. That's how you know whether you're worshiping God or something else. What is the, the, the end focus and goal of your energies, your loyalty, your money, your affection, your time? You spend all your time polishing your 56 Chevy, then you need to ask a serious question. Okay? And in fact, along that line, and using that example, even in his book, Eric Hoffer, who wrote a book called The True Believer, he's not a Christian, he's a philosopher. He said, whatever you think about most is your God. This is the same thing that Luther and Giglio are saying as Christians, but Eric Hoffer identifies this from a secular philosophy point of view. Whatever you think about most is your God. Do you think most about your family? Do you think most about your investments, what the market's doing today? You need to ask yourself a question. Do I have something on the throne of my life other than God? Okay. Now, uh, okay. Questions about any of that? I want to get into what true worship looks like and means now. Okay. You're feeling beaten up, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> uh, all right. What is true worship? We talked about the tendency that people have, the need to worship something, and the tendency to worship something that might truly, not truly be God. Uh, well, true worship is, is an act of transformation that happens when we value God above all else. The Greek word for that we most often translate in Scripture as worship, which is uh, transliterated prosuneo, means to fall down before or to bow down before. To literally, in some cases, the scripture is literally talking about to fall prostrate. Uh, prostrate. I did that again. Prostrate. I don't know the difference of those two words. Prostrate before God. You know, on your face, literally. To fall down before God. To bow down before God. Now, true worship of God happens when we put God first in our lives, when what God says matters more than what other people say, and when loving God matters more than being loved yourself. The prayer of St. Francis includes a line that says, may I, love, may I seek to love more than to be loved. When we feel that way about God, that is an act of true worship. When we're <laughs> Somebody's bells are going on. Um, and so the heart of worship is to seek to know and love God. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, in Matthew 7.22, Jesus says this, many will say to me on that day, this is the, the day of consummation, the final day after, after the resurrection, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. The point of worship, it's not what we do. I mean, there's an aspect in which we have to do something, but the true worship doesn't happen just because we show up in a building or even if we sit down and read scripture, if our hearts are not open, if our lives are not open to God, if we're not truly desiring to have a relationship with God, then we may be like those who said to Jesus, hey, we did all this work in your name, 
We worked hours and hours and hours putting on a second Sunday once a month, and we did X and we did Y and we did Z, and Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you, because our hearts were not really to him. We really did not worship him. True worship is not <coughs> acting, you know, it's not doing service. It is instead to fall into the arms of God, as one writer has said, and say, here I am, do with me what you will. A true act of worship is to fall in, you know, it's, uh, I told you proscuneo, uh, proscuneo, which means to, to bow before God or fall before God, sort of a version of that, that true worship means to fall into the arms of God, to sort of surrender ourselves to Him and say, here I am, do with me what you will. I am yours. A major theme in Scripture is the issue or the, the uh, statement, I guess I should say, in John 4, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And the woman, Samaritan woman at the well is saying, well, we worship God here on this mountain, which was outside Samaria, because they were from the northern kingdom, they got separated from the southern kingdom of the temple. She says, we worship here on this mountain, and you worship at the temple in Jerusalem, you Jews, because the Samaritans and Jews had, had divided. And Jesus says, you know, it's not an issue of where you worship. In fact, that's the least of the issues. It's not a geographical question, he's saying. He then says this, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in, the spirit, in spirit and in truth, and they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in, the, in spirit and in truth. Okay? Um, what does that mean? What does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Because I do believe that brings us to the most pointed understanding of how we begin the process of worshiping God. There are certain requirements we have to worship God. God in spirit. The first one is we must be born again. It simply is not possible for someone to worship as Jesus describes it as being worshiping in the spirit and truth unless they are saved, unless they are um, redeemed by Jesus Christ, part of his body. You must be born again. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And scripture says the spirit of God is given to those who have accepted Jesus Christ. So unless you are in Christ, you do not have the Spirit of God present in your life. And if you do not have the Spirit of God present in your life, you do not know the thoughts of God, you cannot truly worship God. There's a sequence here, and it begins with us accepting Jesus Christ and being saved in Him. All right? And you all know you can ask questions as we go along. So stop me if you've got a question. Okay. So that's the first thing. Yes, Mike? It says... That um, in the end, um, every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess. It Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter if they have the Spirit in them or not. So I'm just. <laughs> well, that's, that's when Jesus is revealed in the last day. That does not mean that all of those people are truly worshiping God. They are simply acknowledging that He is Lord. Uh, in the book of James, it says, You say you believe in God, you do well. The demons believe and they tremble. So when it says that in the final consummation that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, they won't have a choice. That does not mean that they are doing it as an act of worship. It may be as an act of fear that they have to acknowledge because all has been revealed at that point. Just like when the demons said, we know who you are. Exactly. So the, all, the demons always recognized who Jesus was throughout the Gospels when, Je when Jesus cast out demons. In fact, he usually would say, be quiet. Okay, I don't want to hear from you. Uh, but I think that passage, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, does not mean they're all going to be worshiping God. Okay? Many will, but not all. So, um, we must be born again. The Holy Spirit must reside within us for us truly to have an act of, of worship with God. The second thing is, we must be centered and focused on God alone. This has to be a giving up of ourselves to God in order to worship in the Spirit. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This, path, this verse sort of covers the worship in spirit and worship in truth that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, 
So, we must be born again. We must focus ourselves and center ourselves on God alone and our relationship with Him. It needs to be something that is all-encompassing part of us. The third requirement for worshiping in spirit, as Jesus talked about it, is that we have a pure, open, and repentant heart. God cannot receive praise and worship from a heart that is filled with unconfessed sin. Psalm 51 says, My sacrifice, O God, uh, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Now, don't make the mistake of saying you can't have any sin in your life or you can't worship God, because we all have sin in our life. John says, If you say you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. But the question is, are we harboring unconfessed sin that we are unwilling to bring before the Lord and confess and acknowledge because we don't want to give it up? Maybe it's pleasurable or it's fun. Um, if that's true, then we can, if we're in that kind of state, then we cannot worship God openly. We cannot worship God in truth. If we have sin in our life that we have confessed, that we have sought to repent from, that we're working on, so to speak, then God will hear our prayers and He will hear our worship. But if we, again, are living in unconfessed sin, if we are unwilling to confront and seek to repent from, doesn't mean you have to be perfect. You're not going to be. doesn't mean you have to be without sin. You're not going to be. But if you are seeking forgiveness for those sins and trying, then God will hear you. But otherwise, worshiping God in spirit will not work if you have unconfessed, unrepented sin in your heart. Because that means your heart is darkened by that sin. Uh, the very fact is that God cannot look on sin. The reason that Jesus needed to come to redeem us from our sins, to take our sin upon himself is because we couldn't be in relationship with God while we have sin. God, a righteous and holy God, cannot be in relationship with a sinful creature unless and until those sins are forgiven, that they are redeemed, that they are atoned for. And Jesus did all those things for us. But we have to be prepared to confess those things. Yes? They have a question, I'm probably dumb, but anyways, uh, we all know, or as I know, when a, a sin is a bad sin, but the little sins, you know, the little lack of charity for a moment with some person or something. Right. Uh, those kind of go kind of in the bag of forgetting. Yeah, you don't even think about it. No? Yeah. And so how we can confess those? Well, I think that when we confess our sins, um, I'm reminded of Paul on Mars Hill when he told the Greek philosophers, you've got altars to all these particular gods, and then you've got one altar to the unknown god. Well, part of our confessing of sins, at least for me, is confessing the sins that I know. Uh, frequently, I'm going to talk about confession at the end uh, today. Too often, our confession is, Lord, forgive me for all my sins. Amen. Come on. Okay. I think we have to be more contrite than that. And again, it's, I don't have to beat myself up for, God, for Jesus to forgive me of my sins. But he expects me to, to take seriously the fact that his great sacrifice on my behalf because, was because I'm a, I was and am a sinner. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer makes the brilliant point that grace is free, but it is not cheap. And unless we are willing to acknowledge and confess our sins on an ongoing basis, then we deny the, the, the serious price that Jesus paid for us. Okay? It doesn't mean I have to beat myself up to be forgiven. So I think my prayer of confession needs to be a prayer of specific sins that I know I've committed. But then also confess to the Lord, Father, there are other things I have done some of which I am not even aware of. That I am not, you know, because I'm, uh, I'm a poor dumb sheep. I am a broken creature. I sometimes even miss my own sins. Forgive me for those two. Okay? Yes. Is it not part of the work of the Holy Spirit too, to convict it is. sin, righteousness, and judgment? I think if we come before Him with an open heart and say, Father, show me. Absolutely Show me true. that He does do that. Right. I, I, you're absolutely right. The, the conviction of sin is one of the major responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. If we ask Him to do so, He will make us more aware. Okay, so that we can confess more specifically. That's true. Okay, um, so our worship of God, I believe, is directed by our love for Him. As we love, so we worship. Again, in the Scripture, anytime anybody shows up before God in heaven, before the throne, their immediate reaction is to fall down and worship of Him. As we love God, as we seek to know more of Him, as we seek to be in His presence, the reaction is going to be one of worshiping. And unless we have a real passion for God and for His love, there can be no worship in the Spirit. 
One of the things, and I'll give you this here, and I'm going to mention it again in a minute. One of the, when Jesus said we must worship in spirit and in truth, I believe another way of thinking about that is we must worship with our whole heart, the spirit, and we must worship with our whole mind in truth. Okay? So the idea of having a contrite heart, a repentant heart, of seeking the Holy Spirit to be present in us, of being focused on God alone with our heart, that's that's what's required for us to worship God in spirit. Now let's talk about the requirement for worshiping God in truth, and there really is just one issue there. Um, our worship of God in truth, I believe, means that our worship must be properly informed. We have to know who God is, and what He is like, and what He has done in order for us to worship Him. We said earlier, we worship God for who He is, and we worship Him for what He's done. Well, we have to know who He is, and we have to know what He's done in order for us to accurately or, or inappropriately worship Him. Where do we find out those things? Where do we find out who God is and what He has done? Except in Scripture. God has given us the revelation of Himself, of who He is, of what He has done, as well as who we are and what we've done in this. And so I believe worshiping God in truth means to be properly informed about God, who He is, what He's done, based upon and consistent with the Word of God. John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. To worship God in truth means to have, have gone to His Word, have learned of God and of His great work for us, and to worship Him for those things. Okay. So, worshiping God in spirit means to worship Him with our whole hearts. To worship God in truth means to worship Him with our whole mind, and of course, Deuteronomy, and then later Jesus, when asked what is the first and great, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus said, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and all thy mind, and all thy strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So worshiping God in spirit and in truth means worshiping with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength. Particularly, worshiping Him in spirit means with an open and true heart that is repentant. And to worship Him in truth means to worship Him with your mind that as being informed by God's Word as to what God is like and what He has done for us. Okay. Questions about that? So, Norm. So, Russ, could we rightfully and logically say that people who show up at our worship service on Sunday morning who have heard what a good speaker you are, that you get the message out, that they're really just visitors at that point, perhaps, versus worshipers? Well, yeah, you get a lot of looky news on Sunday morning. Right. <laughs> and that's fine, because that's the only way that, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we want them to come and be looky loos mm -hmm. and count on the Holy Spirit to break through some of that, you know, the, the barrier, so that their heart begins to say, you know, there's something here. There's something to this. There's truth in this. Um, that's how people get saved. Very simply, that is how people come to a saving knowledge, is they start out as tourists, and then they decide they're going to live there. Okay? Um, and I, I think that's exactly, I, we, I, it only takes two or three people who really are in an attitude of worship and opening their hearts before the Lord for us to have a sense of worship. In fact, I think that, and, and uh, uh, Foster talks about this, for people to come and really do open their hearts, seek to worship God, uh, every Sunday morning, I say we're there for two reasons, right? What's the first one, the biggest one? Worship. To worship God. And when we have our prayer of invocation, I, I say the things that we're talking about <coughs> We worship you, we adore you, you are a great and mighty God, you are the creator God. Those are the kind of things that we do. Well, it only takes a few people there who really are opening their hearts in worship to God for there to be a sense of worship in our services. And so that's what we need. We need to have a cadre of people who are committed to doing that in worship on Sunday morning, individually worshiping, so that we get a sense of community worship. And that sense of community worship is what the Holy Spirit uses, I believe, to touch the hearts of those looky loos, yeah. those tourists, so they begin to say, there is something here. Did you all, the first time, those of you who attend our church, the first time you came, did you get a sense in which the worship was real? I mean, is it? And, yeah. Okay. Well, it's not me. <laughs> okay. 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeking to worship as well, but it is the Holy Spirit working through the body or some portion of the body that we get that sense. Yes? There's a couple living on our street that you know, being <coughs> and there, mm -hmm. who I talk to them. This old, we, we watch our service at home on TV or whatever. I don't understand that. Yeah, well, they have a problem. There's nothing wrong with getting getting uh, a message so that you can know more and you can learn more, study, and you know that sort of thing is valuable. But to not gather, Scripture very plainly says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. It means go to church. That's what that means. Go and gather with other believers in order to worship. You can watch programs, you can listen to tapes, you can get other input that might teach you and train you as study. But in order to worship, I mean, you, and you need to worship individually, but still there's a sense in which gathering for worship, to come before the Lord as a community. Mm -hmm. When we talked about the church in the, the theology class, mm -hmm. um, we talked about the fact that to Christians in the first century, the early Christians and the writers of the Bible, the very idea that somebody would be a Christian in isolation because they chose to, that they would not go and be part of the body, would have been... Unbelievable to them. I mean, it would have been a complete oxymoron. They would have said, that's not possible. Because part of being the uh, saved and in Jesus Christ, part of being a disciple of Christ, means that you're part of the body of Christ. And Scripture is very plain in saying, you know, you're part of the building, the structure that is the church. Um, and you have gifts that the body needs. When you stay home and think you're getting your worship by watching TV, you're being selfish. You are denying whatever gifts God has given you for the common good, the Bible says. For the common good. You are denying that to the other believers. And you need to be in church. You need to be involved. Watch programs, listen to tapes, all of that for additional growth and benefit. But go to church. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. I think Scripture is very clear about that. So tell them to stop it. Okay. <laughs> Norm? I just to say, I, I don't think you ever met one of our original founders. Jerry McCracken, the mm -hmm. Lucky Loose was one of his favorite descriptive terms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we love Lucky Loose. You know, I, it's, um, we grow because people come once and say, I just, I'm checking this out. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. I just want to see. And if they come and they feel the sense of the Spirit and they feel the joy that our people have and welcoming them and excited when they come in the door, then they want to come back. And it, who knows how many visits it may take before they really start to get a sense that there is something here that I've been looking for. They may not even know what they're looking for, but hopefully they'll get it. If not our church, then in some other church we would pray for that. Every week we pray for every church in the community, yeah. either specifically or, or as a group. They, they look at us, though, then they say, oh, that guy's a Christian. I don't know, he did this, he said that, this happened. You know, we when we get together, we need to look to ourselves to what we're doing or not. Yep. Doing, you know? It makes a difference. I mean, we do have to, you know, uh, a righteous life for the sake of our testimony. Yeah. Yes. Again, in, in uh, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, they say, they decide that Gentiles do not have to become Jews in order to be followers of Jesus. You don't have to be circumcised. You know? But they say, but here's four things you, sh you need to not do, because if you do, you'll blow your witness. In other words, if, if you're seen doing any of these things as a Gentile believer in Jesus, the Jews will reject Jesus because they see what you're doing. It was four things that the Jews had the most trouble with. So, yeah, we have to be concerned about that. We also can't beat ourselves up. I mean, we, we all, we've all been worse people than we are now in Jesus. I, when I got in college, when I, I saved in high school, I really left the Lord in a serious way in college. And when I came back to the Lord, some long time after that, I was having uh, dinner one night with a friend of mine. And she looked across the table and she sort of smiled, shook her head, and I said, what? Edie, what is it? And she said, I, I, sometimes I look at you now and I think about what you used to be like and it's just unbelievable to me. Okay. Christians are not perfect. We're just forgiven. All right? And the phrase, not a hotel for saints, but a hospital for sinners. Exactly. <laughs> and we are all sinners. We need to be yeah. there. Yeah. We, are, we are a hospital for sinners and we are all sinners. Some of us are, are further along in the recovery process, but until the Lord comes back, we are all in recovery. Yes? Well, I was thinking... You pray for the churches in the community, but all, all of us have children that are not in this community. We pray for all of our children. We pray for them too. I mean, okay. you know, okay. Uh, in fact, I, I think just this last week I recall praying for 
our family members and friends, those who are here and those who are not here, that they will be blessed in. You know. So yeah, we do that as well. Okay? So that, I believe, is what it means to worship in spirit and truth. And I, I think that as we, as we consider this, there's some questions we need to, that I want you to ask yourself. The first one is a very simple one in words, but not very simple in concept. And that is, who is God to you? Who is God to you? Okay. Um, and one of the ways that you might get at that is to think about, by what name do you know God? When you pray, do you call him Lord, or Father, or Jesus, or Abba? I know there was a Christian song a number of years ago, and it was a, a woman, it, it was a, it was sort of a story song, and she's talking about a young woman who said, uh, when you say that he's Lord, I'm fine with that, but when you say Father, I don't think so, because she'd been abused by her father. What word you use for God makes a difference. It may be an important indicator of who God is to you. My favorite name for God, because to me it, it, it indicates the scale and scope and awesomeness of God, is the Ancient of Days. I love the name the Ancient of Days for God. That He has always been and He always will be. He is Ancient of Days. Capitalized. Um, because there's a sense in which there's an assurance about that as a, a permanence, a stability, a, you know, God is always kind of thing. Um, well, let me ask you also, I'm not asking you to, to speak out loud, the questions I want you to ask yourself. What do you value most? And I'm asking you that as a self-confessional kind of thing. Is there something else that you think about more than God? We, we had these quotes. Is there something else? that may be sitting on the throne of your life? Is there something else other than God that really may be the focus of your energy and attention and loyalty and money and time? Garden, a bridge club, golf, you know, country club. You need to ask yourselves those questions once you understand what it means to worship God. That question would confuse me a bit because I think each of us has to pay attention and and perform our occupations, our duties and responsibilities of family and, and so on. Uh, so even though I many times will pray during the day, my daily focus can be on the tasks that I'm concerned with. My right. business, my... Okay? So how do we glue that together? Well, I want to talk a little bit about, the, about practicing the presence of God and what it means for us to make this a more constant kind of event, event for us. Um, I think that it may very well be, in fact it is possible, I shouldn't say very well be, it's, it's possible that just by habit, we, you know, we're sincere in our faith of God, in God and we find time for Him and we worship Him, but we still find ourselves with the majority of our time focused on something else, on family or on job or on something else. Okay. So the question is, how do we um, integrate our worship of God as the most important thing in our lives, time-wise and everything else, with all the other responsibilities we have, because we do have other responsibilities. Well, I think the key to that is the thing I want to talk about next, which is practicing the presence of God. I mentioned this in Bible study this morning briefly. In addition to special focused times with God, like your time of Bible study that, that you do weekly, uh, daily, and then you know, more intense study weekly, because those of you who've had the classes, we've talked about this. Uh, or your time of prayer, or your time of worship on Sundays. Those are all wonderful, and those are necessary. It's really intensive, kind of solitary focus on the things of God. And that's what many people do, without realizing that there's a completely different kind of, an additional kind of experience of God, which I believe is what we're really called to. Um, I'll give you a quote here. First from C.S. Lewis. This is from Lewis's book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Lewis says this, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with Him. He walks everywhere incognito. The critical thing that Lewis is saying here, that is at the core of us practicing the presence of God, as you see the title, is we have to really convince ourselves or accept 
first I think we have to be aware of it, and then we have to accept it, that God is present every moment. God isn't waiting for us at church. God is not waiting for us in our favorite chair where we do our Bible study. God is present everywhere at every moment. And God desires for us to be aware of his presence everywhere at every moment. To get to that place where we recognize that God is there, whether we're doing the laundry or washing the dishes or, you know, taking the car to get gas or working in the garden what it, or doing videos, whatever it is we do, for us first to become aware and then begin to do something with the fact that God is there every moment. And He is anxious, He is listening, He is waiting, He is anxious for us to be in a relationship with Him. You know, one writer, uh, and I'm not sure which book it was I, I was reading this in, one writer said, suppose you had been in the first century and when Jesus was alive and you went up to some of his closest followers and said, I, I would like to be able to talk to Jesus. Can I do that? And they said, well, in fact, you can talk to Jesus anytime you want. He's anxious to be with you. He will talk with you about anything that you're interested in. And he's ready to do it anytime, every day. He's available to you. How astonishing would that be? And yet that's exactly the case. God desires to be present to us every moment. He is waiting. He is listening. He is present. When we begin to understand that and experience God all the time, that is what it means to practice the presence of God. And I'm going to talk to you about how to do that. But one, first I want to give you a quote. This is from Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence is a 17th century French monk. Somebody, I mentioned him in Bible study. Somebody uh, said correctly that he actually was not a full monk. He was at a monastery, but he went there in order to, to serve the brothers, to work. You know, he, he, was, he was not part of the regular orders. He was a monastic... Um, what's that? Servant. Yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking he was a roadie. You know, he was a monastic roadie. Um, who, who helped take care of the things in the, in the monastery. But he was a great spiritual man, and he wrote a book, 17th century book, called The Practice of the Presence of God, which is still in print today. And it's a wonderful little book. You know, that's a little book, it really is. He talks about what it was like for him to experience the presence of God no matter what he was doing. He talks about working in the kitchen, peeling potatoes, and having an experience of God being there with them and talking with God about at one point in the practice of the presence of God, Brother Lawrence writes this, I make it my business to rest in His, that is Christ's, holy presence, which I keep myself in by a habitual, silent, and secret conversation with God. This often causes me joys and raptures inwardly, and sometimes also outwardly, so great that I am forced to use means to moderate them and prevent their appearance to others. I'm sure it's less than he think he's nuts. Okay. Um, the simplest way to understand this is Brother Lawrence understood that God was there all the time, and he chose to talk to him all the time about whatever he was doing. It's pretty much as simple as that. If you do believe that God is always present, that God is always listening, that God always wants to, wants to be in interaction with you, then all you have to do is talk to him. And to do so on an ongoing basis. This is something as a discipline I have just really been learning in the last year or so. I'll ask God what he thinks of stuff. Okay? Um, how, should, how do you think I should handle this, Lord? You know, not big, earth-shaking, massive issues. Um, but that's really cool. Don't you think so, God? Now, that may sound silly to you. But the point is, whatever you are doing, whatever your activities are, wherever you are during your day or your life, talk to God about it. As simple as that. As though he's your best friend and he's sitting in the passenger seat and you're, you're wanting to just communicate with him about it. That is what it means to practice the presence of God. A God who is listening and waiting and there. Yes? I don't know if this is appropriate, but last night I was watching the passengers come off the cruise ship. And there was a woman who came, and she literally, what, what made me think of this was the need to moderate something. 
she came over to the anchors and she said, we're not supposed to stop, but I must say, we were saved by the glory of God. And she just, she, her enthusiasm was phenomenal yep. at that point. Yeah, I, and I think that, and it sounds like she, I'm going to talk about gratitude in a minute. It sounds like for all of the, the really miserable circumstances they found themselves in, that she was giving praise to God for protecting them, for saving them, whatever. Right. You know, that's the gratitude. I'm going to, again, I'm going to talk about some other specific issues related to this. But the main thing here is practicing the presence of God is not about a strategy. There's, it's not a strategy. It's about a relationship. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you love Jesus, if you are in Christ, if you believe that God loves you and is present to you all the time, then practice your relationship with Him, His presence with you all the time. Now, at times you might not do it, not like Brother Lawrence says, you might not want to do it out loud, you know, uh, simply because people might not understand. It's not because we're afraid of what they think, it's because th that might not be the best witness. You know, um, yes? Uh, this reminds me of a verse that says, pray without ceasing. I used to have a problem with that. Okay. Because I'd sit there and go, how do I pray without ceasing when I'm driving my car? I'm not going to do that. Yep. This addresses it from a practical point, uh, point exactly. It absolutely does. In fact, now that you mention that passage from Philippians 4, um, well, um, I won't get into that not right now, but you're exactly right. This is how you pray without ceasing. Most of us have it in our heads that prayer means I sit down, I've got a list, I tell God what I need, what I want, etc. Well, we've talked about, when we talked about prayer, the fact that that's not what prayer is. Prayer is relationship. Okay? But there's several different words for prayer, and the most important one, the most powerful one, the one that Jesus uses when even his disciples aren't able to perform miracles, means literally to call on God to be present with us. All right? Prosukomai is the Greek word. To call on God to be present meaning to participate with us in something. Well, that's what it means when you carry on a conversation with God throughout the day. You are praying without ceasing. You are calling upon Him to be present in your life, practicing His presence all day long. It really isn't more complicated than that. And yet, not only Brother Lawrence, C.S. Lewis, and others who have experienced this in their lives, this is where you come to feel the sense that God truly is the God that you love and worship and are open to, and not just somebody that you go and give a, give a list of needs to once or twice a day, or however often. This is what it means to worship God all the time, to pray without ceasing. Okay. Well, you know, what you're talking about, and we all believe, is that we have the presence of God with us all the time. Well, when I'm watching TV, and I tell you I try to watch all the decent programs, but even in the decent programs, there are some things that if my mother was there, I would switch it immediately off. <laughs> but God is there, His presence is there, God. and I don't switch it at all. Yep. So we need to be more, I need to be more conscious that God is with me, and I should clean, well, the, clean the atmosphere too. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking it to the point of saying, okay, if I start doing this, then that means I'm going to have to change some. And that's very true. Yeah. You start doing this and you will change. First you'll recognize that you need to change. We all do. We can all do better. We can all be more what God wants us to be. But we will start to see, you know, if, God's the, if we really start taking seriously the fact that God is there all the time, then that may, you know, you, you can't actually go, go in your bedroom and lock the door and think that he's not going to see you anymore. Okay? <laughs> Um, that, that makes a, that makes a difference here. Um, the there are positives and negatives about this, but the bracelets that, that uh, especially kids were wearing, some adults too. Uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Yeah, they, that that kind of got um, overused. it got overused. It got a little cheesy. You know, there was I saw one guy a clip from a from a celebrity poker game. You know, and the guy's trying to decide whether to raise or fall. And they said, well, what would Jesus do? <laughs> so it got a little bit of But the idea behind that of recognizing that Jesus is there, that God is present with you, that he cares what's going on, that he's paying attention, and for us to have a conversation with him about that is all right. That's all correct. Whether that 
particular thing has been overdone a little bit or not, or whether it's been parried or not. Okay? Some of the things that I think that, that will lead us in this direction toward practicing the presence of God is for us to think about, um, do we allow God to get our attention during the day? Or are we so intent on stuff that he can't even break through? I think if the, part of the problem is if we are so intent that we're not allowing God to break through, maybe we need to recognize we have a responsibility to stay open. Martin? A different prayer rather than God help me to get this deal, help me to get on time, help me to, is God help me to honor you and everything that you would say. Exactly. We're all free by the meat. And uh, if you can practice that presence, then that will make sense. <coughs> it's not so much what you accomplish, then it's that you're giving glory to God by who much more. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and it involves things like, you know, oh, traffic is horrible and I'm late for a meeting and there are people waiting on me. Ah! If I practice the presence of God, my response is going to be, Lord, I'm feeling really stressed out about this. And I know you don't want me to be stressed out. That's not honoring to you. So give me the right heart and the right attitude about this. Okay? You have any, have any advice for me here, God? Because I'm feeling really strained about this. Literally. To be that, that open, that when we, honest. When we know we're not in control, yep. then we can relax. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. right. Like put him in the driver's seat and say, well, we're late. <laughs> That's, That's what it is. That's what it is. And God is still in control. Now, let me give you a couple of spiritual exercises that might help you get there. First, pick a task that you have to do. A task, a job, a, 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 you know, a, a, some errand, something that you have to do. Talk to God about it before you do it. Just pick, start with one. Talk to God about it before you begin. Ask Him what He thinks. Ask Him for His assistance, whatever it might be. And then once you've completed it, talk to Him about it again. About how it went, what your thoughts were, what you think He might have, how He might have reacted to that. So pick something and involve God in it before, during, and after as a start to feel what it's like to pray without ceasing, to experience the presence of God. Then once you've done that once or twice, take a day, wake up in the morning and say, all right, Lord, today, this whole day, I'm offering myself to you, and I want, I'm asking you to make yourself present to me in a way that even I, poor dumb sheep that I am, can be aware of. Throughout the day, try to keep reminding yourself that you are intending to live with the presence of God being evident to you throughout that day. Now, if you wander off, if you forget it for a while, don't be discouraged. God is always pleased when you come back. He's still there. He hasn't left. You may have wandered off mentally or emotionally. But when, it, when you ask Him to keep reminding you, and when you are reminded, you come back to Him. Thank Him for that and experience His presence again. And just talk to Him about stuff. All the things that you might say to your best friend if they were sitting there, you know? That is an ugly sign, God. <laughs> you know? And I'm not saying this lightly. What I'm saying is, it's an effort for whatever it is that's happening in your life, whatever your thoughts are, whatever your experiences are, to practice exposing yourself or opening yourself to God being present in that. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, And within that day that you set aside for God and say, okay, God, I want you to, to be present with me all day. Help me be aware of you. If I wander off, bring me back to an awareness of your presence. As you're doing that, set some times during the day where you stop and focus on God as times of prayer, as times of checking in, especially if you're trying to do this all day long, practicing the presence of God, where you're really being more intentional. I've told the story before about, uh, about one of the pastors that at University Press, and a friend of mine who I was in seminary with was his secretary for a summer, it's sort of an internship kind of thing in the church, and um, she had Tim's calendar, and right after she started take, keeping care, taking care of his calendar, people would be calling for, for appointments and stuff, and he had several times during the day, time set aside, like 15 minutes at a time or whatever, that said SBL on his calendar. And Marta's trying to book his time for because a lot of people wanted to see Tim. Tim Dearborn's his name. Great guy. And uh, Marta told me the story. And she said, so she finally went to Tim after a few days and said, Tim, I got people wanting to meet with you, and you've got these things on your calendar that say SBL. Can I play with those? Can I move them around? And what are they? And he said, Well, no, those are locked in.
because SPL stands for Stand Before the Lord. He scheduled during his day times, small increments of time where, no, where there were no other meetings and he wouldn't take phone calls because he, was, he had time to stand before the Lord, to present himself to God and say, how am I doing, God? What do you desire for me? A time of worship? Intimate communication with God? Of checking in? Now, if, I don't know this for a fact about Tim, but if I, what I do know of him, my bet is that he probably is quite good about practicing presence all the time. And that it's in addition to that that he had those stand before the Lord times. Okay. So that's a great exercise for us to do, to stand before the Lord. And as we start doing this, there's some other things that will start manifesting themselves. As we start keeping company with Jesus all day long, and we have a deeper relationship with Christ, the presence of God in our lives every day, as we begin to experience being in relationship with God, not just dropping in every once in a while, then I believe we'll start seeing every moment as more sacred. I believe we start being more present to every moment, less in a rush to get to the next thing, because God is present now in here, in this thing I'm doing. It will slow us down. And not slow us down as, as though get things less things done, but slow us down in terms of slowing our heart pace down. Uh, Martin, Martin Luther said that I have so much to do that I can't get it all done unless I pray three hours a day. Okay? And I think this start, starts having that kind of effect. Another thing that it will that will happen to us. Um, is based upon Jesus' comment about as much as you've done in the least of these, my brothers, you have done it in the need. My friend Richard Sears, teaching a Bible study once um, when I was in college, or I was just out of college, he said, okay, for a minute, I want you to think of the most despicable person that you know. <laughs> I mean, the people that are just, the, some person in your life that is just obnoxious and smelly and a pain in the buns, you just can't stand to be around them when they walk in a room. You want to leave. They're just horrible. That's who Jesus is to you. Because that's the least of these. Okay, the least of these doesn't just mean the poor and the children and the broken. It means the least desirable. Well, one of the things is we practice the presence of of God, the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives in a more active way, that I believe we start seeing the least of these, the least desirable, the least pleasant, the most problematic people, more with his eyes. That one I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think that's one of the effects of us practicing the presence of, of God every day, every minute, as much as we can. Okay, it's 10 after. We haven't taken a break yet. Let's take five minutes. We'll come back to 15. <laughs> We're talking about practicing the presence of God. And I want to give you some other particular ways in which you can, you can do that. And um, you say, well, how do I talk to God all the time? All right. uh, well, just answer his phone when he calls. Uh, the, I think the most important way, and, and I think in many ways spiritually, one of the things that we miss, that we really need to start practicing, and that will be part of our practicing the presence of God all the time, is, is to... Where is it? Going. Ah, there we go. Is to practice gratitude. Everything you are, everything you have, everything you are blessed by is a gift to you from God. In Bible study this morning, we talked about you know, the treasures you have, your money, your possessions, your material blessings, your time, the very fact that you are alive and moving, and your uh, talents, all of the things you're capable of doing, all are gifts from God. Everything you have are gifts from God. The brokenness that you experience, the illness, the whatever, those are, those are really products of the fall. That was not how God intended it to be. It was our sin that introduced all of that hard stuff. God still supports us and encourages and maintains us and blesses us and shows us grace and mercy even in the midst of those things. But all of the things that God gives us, we should be thanking Him for all the time. Are we? I mean, you can practice the presence of God by simply spending your time thanking God for every event and activity. 
D.K. Chester, one of my great heroes, the people who write about him say that one of the, one of the primary characteristics of that man in his life is he was grateful for everything. He would give thanks for a flower or a cloud or a, a post box just for the design of it and the glory of it and the wonder of the world that God gave us. And it wasn't because he was an idiot. He was a genius almost beyond count. But he recognized the glory and grace of all the stuff God has given us. Yes? When I'm feeling overwhelmed by the topes and baches of life, <laughs> I always go back to this old song. Count your blessings. Mm -hmm. Count them one by one. Exactly. And it really makes a difference. Yeah. That's for me. Yeah. Was that Penny Crosby? Count your blessings? I don't remember. I don't. I think that may. Count well, your blessings. Well, it's an old I know. Old well, Penny Crosby is an old old Yeah, machine. yeah. Probably and she was blind. Yeah. You know, she was a blind woman writer. She's probably written as many hymns as in, in the English mm -hmm. language as almost anybody. Maybe Charles Wesley, or I don't know. But um, anyway, so the idea of giving thanks. A couple of verses here. Psalm 136, 1 to 4. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Give thanks to God for His love and His grace and His mercy and the beauty of His creation. Every butterfly you see, every cloud that goes by or doesn't in the blue sky, uh, the glory of the sunshine. And you know, Carolyn and I have been in awe because we recently um, planted some stuff in a, in a vegetable garden. And Holy moly, who knew? This stuff actually grows. And you cut it off and eat it, and you go back out, it's still growing. And we're going, this is amazing. <laughs> I grew up with a garden. I kind of used that to this. But, but it's not like we actually did any work. We got a few things, and our, our housekeeper stuck them in the ground. And we're going, man, that chart is like, you could, you know, you could sit down under that and drink a pina colada and be in shade. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> to, to be amazed by things. To be in awe of the wondrous things that God has given us and to thank Him for those things. And again in Philippians 4, 4 to 7, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, Paul wrote that letter to the Philippian church from prison in Rome. He was in prison. He was writing to a Philippian church that was being persecuted. So a man imprisoned in Rome, a church that is being persecuted, and his communication to them is rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And inherent in that rejoicing is giving thanks giving thanks to God for the blessings He's given us. If someone saved your life, I'm sure you would be grateful. How do you feel towards somebody that saved your soul for all eternity? <laughs> Is there not room for gratitude there? Jesus, it's interesting to notice that Jesus Himself practiced gratitude. Two instances. One with 5,000, one with 4,000. Jesus, Jesus is out with his disciples, out well away from town, and all these thousands of people have come out to hear him preach, to be healed by him, to be uh, freed from demons. And Jesus says, these people are hungry, they need to eat. His disciples said, well, what are you talking about? It'd take more than a year's wages just to, just to give them crumbs. And they said, Jesus, send them back into town. Make them walk back and get their own food. Well, instead of Jesus complaining because he didn't have enough to feed these people out here on the hillsides in Galilee, he says, well, what do we have? Well, we have some loaves and fishes. And what does Jesus do with the loaves and fishes? He gave thanks. First thing he did was he thanked God. He's got 5,000 people. He's got a couple of fishes and a, and a few loaves. And he thanks God for it. God the Father. And then what happens? It's enough. It's enough. And then seven baskets gathered up left over. 
instead of us finding ourselves in situations that look completely untenable and griping about it and whining about it and moaning about it, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. Jesus gave thanks when He didn't have enough and it was enough. I think there's a message in there for us. I believe gratitude in all things. I believe that if you are seeking to practice the presence of God, and as you're starting out, you don't know what else to say, try saying thanks. And you can find a lot of things, if you're, if you're sensitive to this, if you're open to it, you can find a lot of stuff to be thankful for. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So gratitude, I believe, is one of the keys, both to us having the right kind of relationship um, with God, and also is a way for us to begin to practice the presence of God on a long basis. If you have nothing else to say, you can still say thanks. Okay. Um, another thing that you might do is to start keeping, if you're keeping a journal, as I say, I may talk about journal, journaling a little bit later because I haven't really dealt with that. If you keep a prayer journal or a journal of any kind, maybe start keeping a sidebar kind of list of the abundances that God has blessed you with. All of the gifts that God has given, the blessings, the abundance. And folks, there's nobody sitting in this room that has not experienced abundances. All, right? um, all of the wonderful things that God has given you, start writing them down. And I think you might be amazed, if you're disciplined about writing those things down, just how many pages you start filling up with the great gifts. And then the converse side of this, in terms of our gratitude to God, is... Um, stop focusing on the things you don't have. And there's, there's some very practical ways to do that. Stop getting catalogs. <laughs> I'm serious. What is a catalog except a way of seeing things you don't have that you think you might want? Am I right? Yes. Stop, women, stop buying beauty magazines. You remember that sort of desiderata thing that was on the radio a long time ago about wear sunscreen? Mm -hmm. One of the things that the guy said in that is all these, it was advice to, high, to graduates, you know, from high school or college, whatever. And one of the things he said in there is do not buy beauty magazines, they will only make you feel ugly. <laughs> it's absolutely true. My point here, whether it be catalogs or beauty magazines or other things, if there are things that you are indulging in in your life, there's nothing inherently wrong in a catalog. I mean, you might find something in there you really do need. But these things have a tendency in our consumer-oriented culture to make us make comparisons or identify things we don't have that we don't really need and we think we do need them. And so we end up wanting to buy this stuff. Sky Mall. In a whole Sky Mall magazine, in a whole Sky Mall catalog, there are five things that probably would even work. I mean, it just, some of it's just crazy stuff, all right? But it looks really good when you're reading it sitting in that seat on the airline, doesn't it? You know, and they tell you to turn off your candle while you're taking off landing and you don't have anything else to look at. But the point is, don't make comparisons that lead you to focus on what you don't have and what you, you know, you, instead focus on the things that you can give thanks for. You're not going to find that in catalogs and beauty magazines. Okay? Unless you're one of, those, one of those beauty magazines. Yes, uh -huh. Of course, you could be thankful that you don't have some of those things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, we have, Carolyn and I know a guy, Aiden Mackey. Aiden and his wife Doris live in England. And Aiden, when G.K. Chesterton fell so far out of favor, nobody hardly knew who he was even in England anymore. Aiden Mackey sort of kept him alive, you know, <laughs> kept his memory alive. And now it's re there's a resurgence of interest in, in Chesterton. Uh, and he was a, a book dealer who specialized in Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and Dorothy Sayer and those kind of folks. Well, we went over. I contacted him when we were going to England because I, I was told he could tell us things. He and Doris took us into their home. He took like two days and took us around and showed us everything. Well, Aiden is this great, great man of God, he and Doris. And he visited Minneapolis because Minneapolis is where the American Chesterton Society is located. That's their headquarters, because Dale Alquist, another friend of ours, founded it, and he lives there. Well, you know what else is in Minneapolis? 
the Mall of America, the biggest mall in, in the country. Well, Dale thought, okay, this, Aiden's English, you know, this little, little scrawny English guy. He's not short, but he's thin. Well, he took Aiden to the Mall of America, and they're wandering around looking at all of these really chintzy shops, because most of them stored in the Mall of America really chintzy shops. And Aiden turned to, to Dale and said, you know, I never realized there were so many things I didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe magazine, like you say, well, maybe magazine will show us the things we don't want. Um, but let's focus on that. Uh, another thing I want to talk about in terms of our relationship, our worship relationship with God. Um, and I think, uh, okay, I don't have this up there. Um, is... Celebration. This is in Foster's book. Uh, he talks about it. God is a God who celebrates. Remember earlier I said that one writer has said that the act of worship is when God invites us to the, to the dance, that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in relationship with one another. They're in motion with one another. Uh, God literally is a community within him own, his own self. And we are invited to join in that relationship in a very real way, to join the dance. God, I think, in the Trinity, in his active world, even, the, God would not have made so much that is beautiful and fascinating unless he was a God that took pleasure in things. And I believe that unless he's a God who celebrates. I believe God celebrates the joy of his own creation. We know the angels do. It says that the angel, the son of heaven, you know, uh, sing glory and praises in heaven in joy. So I believe God invented delight. He invented joy. He invented celebration. C.S. Lewis says that joy is the absolute domain of the Christian. Joy for us, celebration for us, is our birthright. It is part of what we have a right to as servants, those who follow Jesus. And throughout Scripture, not only New Testament, but Old Testament as well, we see over and over, even in unlikely circumstances, we are, t we are told about identifying, uh, cases of identifying joy and of celebrating the things of God, the joy of God. For instance, in the book of Lamentations of all places, you know what Lamentations are, they're, they're it's, a lament is a, is a wail and a moan of, of mourning and grief. Well, Jeremiah, who's called the weeping prophet, because Jeremiah had a rough go of it. He was persecuted and beaten and jailed and all kinds of stuff. He was there when Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed. That's The book of Lamentations is about that. It's, a, it's about the destruction of God's holy temple and his holy city and the imprisonment by the Babylonians of the Jewish people. It's a really rough time for the Jewish people. And yet, in Lamentations, the third chapter, beginning with the 20th verse, you hear first the current situation, and then you hear Jeremiah's reaction to it. He says, My soul is downcast within me, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, they are new every morning. Mm. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. You've probably heard that, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Did you know it was in Lamentations and it was written at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple? This is where we, even in the midst of untold trauma, which is what this was to the Jewish people and to, and to Jeremiah, we can say God's compassions never fail. They are new every morning. We can find reason for delight and hope and celebration, even at hard times. How much more can we not find them in times of beauty and glory? You know, the glory of fellowship, of family, of uh, a good meal, of a bright sky. We can celebrate this stuff, and I don't think that we realize often enough that part of our uh, practicing the presence of God, of worshiping God, needs to be an act of celebration. We are told in Scripture that, that at any time in heaven, the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, the archangels, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and all the company of saints overflow with joy in the presence of their Creator God. We too should be joining in celebration. We can. It's our birthright to celebrate the great things of God. 
there's this wonderful, and, and, and to not be worried whether everybody understands that or not, there's a wonderful uh, little story in 2 Samuel, a little picture, that when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, King David celebrates before the Lord, and he does so by dancing before the Lord in front of the Ark of the Covenant they're carrying it in. And his wife, Miriam, uh, not uh, Miriam, uh, Michael. 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 Michael, yes, no. she sees him dancing and is embarrassed, thinking the king of Israel is out there dancing around like a fool. <laughs> as we would say in the South, like, oh. <laughs> and she's embarrassed, and he comes in, and she says, good job, king of all Israel, out there dancing around like a peasant. You know, you're embarrassing yourself, and me too. And David says, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated only in my own eyes. In other words, I am going to celebrate before the Lord, even if you think it looks silly. Because God deserves my celebrating His great mercy and grace and joy to me. So if we set our eyes on God, if we're willing to celebrate, you never mind looking a little silly. You know, try dancing before the Lord in your own living room sometime. Just enjoy in celebration. Okay? It's, it's a powerful thing. Of course, my studio is on the third floor, so people in the street can probably see me. <laughs> um, any questions about that? I have a little different problem. I'm blessed with a house, and the house has a crack in the ceiling and a mold behind the bathroom and a silly tree here and termites there and this chair leg broke and you know I was dwelling on all these minor aggravations. Why is do I have all these things? My shoelace broke again today. You know, and it just made me think about the big things. And so each Saturday yeah. I'll do a half a dozen repairs and just kind of ignore yeah. the rest of it until next week. <laughs> yeah, and celebrate the fact you have a house. Oh, that's yeah. what that's okay. you have to remember. Yeah, and, and, and very nice house. I mean, people we've been there. People who go in don't see the stuff you know behind the in, in the cabinets or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, we can celebrate those things. I when I was with World Vision, you know, uh, people who received help from World Vision in Africa during the famine in the, in the 80s. I mean, I've seen people who literally lived in a, a, a hut made from straw and cow manure, who the only clothes they have are the clothes they're, they're wearing, and they're torn and tattered and everything else. They were given a calf, you know, that could, they could get milk from, eventually, you know, uh, it's a pepper, and eventually have, you know, breed it, have another calf. They dance in joy and celebration before the Lord because He was so good to them. What is wrong with me? Okay. What's that? All those magazines. All those magazines. Yeah, the catalogs. That's what's wrong with me. Okay. I want to talk about um, one other thing now before we get to confession, and that is a way in which you can celebrate the joy of the Lord in a quiet way, and that is to practice the Sabbath. I preached recently on the Sabbath, a couple of different passages in Mark where Jesus heals on the Sabbath and where he really indicts the Pharisees for not understanding that the Sabbath, which had become by the time of Jesus, a burden on the people. There were all these rules that had been layered on them about what they were not allowed to do on the Sabbath. Jesus reminded them the original purpose of the Sabbath celebration, which was a day of rest, one day out of seven to rest, in honor of the fact that God had rested after six days of labor and created the universe, that the, the Sabbath celebration was one in which God was saying, you don't have to work all the time. You don't have to be productive all the time. You need to take time for yourself to rest and to think of the things of God and not have to be possessed by the need to be productive and to earn a living all the time. That this is the reason it was a law, because God was so intent on doing this. It was a blessing that had to be enforced by law, given human nature. Well, the Sabbath is something that we, we're not, we're no longer under the law of the Sabbath. We are not required to be obedient to it or be judged for it. But it is still a gift to us. Jesus was very clear in saying this was given as a blessing and a gift from God for our sakes. We, without any of the downside of not observing it, we have the opportunity, I believe, to worship God by observing the Sabbath as much as we can. It's very hard for me to observe the Sabbath because I work on Sunday. Okay? 
okay? And then I and then I work on Monday because we have classes, okay? So, but I think for most of us to be able to <coughs> set aside as much <coughs> Sunday as we can, or a day, it doesn't have to be Sunday. There's nothing magical about Sunday. It's the fact that that's when we do gather for church. That that's a day when we can, you know, probably more directly do this. To set aside a day when we rest when we renew ourselves physically as well as spiritually, when we uh, find time to be with the Lord without other you know, distractions or that sort of thing. For the ancient Jews, until the Pharisees and the teachers of the law made it such a burden, the very idea was their, their Sabbath started, and they practiced Sabbath on Saturday, of course. Of course, that's where we get Sabado in Spanish, the Sabbath, Saturday. They would start at sunset on Friday night. And they would have, you know, the lighting of candles, the recognition of God's blessing. They would not work, you know, that they would, uh, and when they rested, they would wake up on Saturday morning. And they would say, this is a day where we do not have to work. We do not have to be productive. We can come before the Lord. The idea was that um, they, they woke up on Sabbath morning in a world they didn't make that they had no real responsibility for, and they could spend the day focusing on the friendship and the love that God had given them that they didn't deserve. So it's a day for us to acknowledge that all things are of God, as much as we want. <coughs> and I want to encourage you all, as much as you can, to start trying to practice the Sabbath, to set aside time. Now, the Sabbath is a time for joy. I mean, have, have a meal with family or friends. Go for a walk. Do something you enjoy. Um, as long as it's not going to the casino or something like that. <laughs> but, but something that is restful, that is renewing for you, that is part of celebration with family. Recognize God through all of that. Practice the presence of God especially on Sunday. A day for stopping, for recognizing that you have limits, for recognizing that God does not want you to burn yourself out, that he does not want you to do backbreaking work seven days a week, which is, the, you know, God gave the gift to the Israelites right after they came out of slavery in Egypt. Where when you're a slave, you don't get a day off. And he made that something for them and for their sake. So I want to encourage you this next week, if it's Saturday night or whichever day you try to set aside, I, I, I strongly recommend that you try practicing a Sabbath rest. Maybe on Saturday night, you begin your Sabbath on Saturday night, light a candle just as a way of acknowledging. This is part of what the Jewish ceremony is. Light a candle just a way of inviting Jesus presence, inviting God's presence with you. And spend the evening with family. Have a meal together, relax, rest, go to bed early, sleep well, wake up on Sunday morning, have time together, come to worship, spend time in worship, maybe have lunch with friends, spend an afternoon, whatever it is, puttering, just relaxing before the Lord. Don't And, and don't let yourself have a to-do list. Okay, but just spend it before the Lord. I think that we have lost the grace that the Sabbath was intended to give us once a week. And we need to recover that. Rich? There's a good scripture verse for that. This is the day the Lord has made, so we rejoice. And be glad in it. Yes. That's a good one to start with that. Yep. Let, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And then, of course, there is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, one of the fourth commandment. Uh, but again, we don't do this because we're commanded to, but because God has given it to us as a grace and a mercy. And so we want to practice that. So set aside that time for rest, for intimacy with God, for things that give you joy and renewal, not for things that you have to do for your job or because, you know, the, you know if I don't get these tasks done, my spouse is going to be really mad at me or whatever. You know. Find time before the Lord. Any questions about that? Now, one thing I want us, one thing more I want us to deal with, and that is confession. I confess to you that we're dealing with this right at the end. We have, and I talked about this again a little bit in Bible study this morning. We have lost the sense of confession, I believe, because we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Again, related to our Protestant approach to the Catholic. Uh, the Catholics consider confession a sacrament. They have seven sacraments, we have two. Well, confession had ended up being people being required to present themselves to a priest, to confess their sins to a priest, and for the priest to give them absolution. 
And to, to the, in the Protestant Reformation, the sense was very clear that God has been removed from this equation. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of a priest being able to give absolution in God's name without actually God being as involved in it, and also the idea that there was a special subset of people, the priests, who had the power to absolve from sin. When Scripture talks about, you are a holy people, you, know, you are a royal priesthood, meaning all of us. So the priesthood of all believers was one of the themes of the Protestant Reformation. It's part of what we believe. And again, I think this is one of the cases where we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Because confession, as it may have been practiced in the 1500s by the Catholic Church when the Reformation started, because that may not have been appropriate, we have lost the idea of being able to confess our sins to one another. Not to a, not to a priest who's set aside for that, but for to another person who was part of the priesthood of believers. Two passages, um, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, which I believe give us that direction. The first one is about confessing our sins to God, which we need to do on a regular basis. Those of you who come to Lakeside Presbyterian Church know that we have a prayer of confession every week. Included in that prayer of confession, there is a moment of silence for people to confess their own private sins. So we confess corporately, and we leave people, encourage people to confess privately as part of that. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a statement of confession. You know, look me over, God. See what's wrong with me. Where have I fallen short? What are my sins? Make me aware of those sins. And I confess them to you and ask to be cleansed from them. So we need to be confessing to God on a regular basis, not just corporately, not just on Sunday morning, but on an ongoing basis. Again, not because we're not, we're not loved unless we confess, not that we're not even forgiven unless we confess, but because us confessing shows that we have gratitude, that we acknowledge the severity of the price that Jesus paid for our own sin, and we don't take that lightly. The grace is free, but it is not cheap. And we need to remember that. Then we have James 5.16, which is talking about a different kind of confession. Not the confession directly to God and seeking forgiveness. But James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Ooh. Confessing my sins to another person. The reason I think most of us have a problem with this is not that we have a problem with confessing our sins to another person, it's that we have a problem with the other persons. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have, most of us, a sense that there is a person or people, or many of us don't at least, that there is a person or people that we can confess our sins to safely. Mm -hmm. That we know it's going to be in confidence, we know they're going to receive it the way we desire for them to receive it, which is as an act of confession and attrition, there is something, and this has always been understood to be the case, there is something astonishingly healing about confessing our sins to another person. This was true Catholic confession as well. But the problem is that in the church today, we, do, we are not intimate enough with each other. We are not close enough with each other. We, are not, we do not present ourselves to each other in a way that you know that you can trust the other people. And we should be. As brothers and sisters in the Lord, as members of the body of Christ, we should be people that know that we can trust the other people. And we're missing that, and we need to try to regain that. So the issue of confession being a problem for us, we really need to address a different problem, and that is we need to do everything we can to be trustworthy and, and loyal people to one another. That we build the bonds of relationship within the church so that that trust can exist. And that comes with, with practice. Michael? I, I can't imagine what this really looks like, because in all the churches I've been to since I was a young boy, I've never seen it really in practice. It's, well, was, only I, after somebody gets caught. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. After someone gets caught, yeah. or um, and all the churches are so, like you said, so closed off, we're scared what someone else is going to think. Um, I did go to one church that was another strange extreme where they called all the men forward to stand in a line and pass the mic down and confess all their sins wow. to everybody publicly over a microphone. <laughs> and that's 
some strange extreme, uh, there's, uh, what does this really look like? I can't imagine. Well, what, uh, I think Foster has a couple of good examples of his own experience of confession uh, in his book, um, the chapter on confession. He talks about the fact that of having someone that you grow up with, and he, he also talks about the fact that if you don't have anyone in your life that you feel you can confess to right now, pray, ask God to bring somebody into your life that you can trust in that way. Mm -hmm. And not only that you can trust in that way, but that is really trustworthy in that way. So first, we ask God to bring someone to our lives like that. And I think very wisely, he also, um, Foster also acknowledges that if there are sins that you have that you cannot confess in specifics, then if you have someone in your life that you can go to and say, I have a sin that I have the burden of a sin that is troubling me so much I cannot talk about the specifics of it. I cannot bring myself at this point to share with you exactly what it is, but I am heavily burdened in your prayer. And have that person pray for you and to... to are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just seems wrong for me to keep talking. And she's having a problem. Um, and to say, pray for me for the sin, that the, the details of which I can't get into. And it may be that we start there and God will lead us to the place where we do have a secure enough and safe enough relationship with somebody. But again, part of what it is, is we need to be praying that the whole body is, is uh, knitted together in such a way that we begin to develop that kind of ability. Now, the idea of calling people up and giving them a microphone and say, okay, everybody confess your sin, so that everybody knows. I actually saw once a woman come to the front and she was saying, okay, I, want, I need to confess my sin. This was at a charismatic church that I visited with a friend. Now, pick it up the charismatics. Uh, and, she, and this woman said, I need to confess that, you know, my husband is really wimpy, and so I get frustrated with that, so sometimes I, you know, I sort of take command because he won't. And in front, of, in front of everybody, in the front of the church. And she said, you know, and I had this vision where, where um, I had his pants. I, was, I, was, I had the pants of the family, and, and God told me to go out and take, take his pants off the line where I had them and take them and give them back to him so that he could wear the pants of the family. And I'm thinking, holy crap, lady, do you really think that's the right thing to do in public? <laughs> I mean, I was just appalled. And I, I would be appalled if I saw it today. That's not what God wants, to say something that's going to be in, in public that's going to be embarrassing. This is talking about confessing our sins to each other, I believe, in private. Now, there may be times when we're called upon to make a, a public profession of, or confession of our sins, particularly if somebody's in a role of leadership and they've violated the trust that's involved in that leadership. Now, as has been said, usually the only time we have Christian leaders who stand up and confess their sins to the body is after they get caught. <laughs> uh, and that's, that does, that's not pretty helpful. But, uh, yeah, but I think we need to be praying that the church begins to have this ability to, to confess to each other and to be praying that we have somebody we can confess to, that we build a trust and relationship. That's, that's, what, that's what I was going to say. I think what we need to do is, we the people, is to learn to receive a confession and not say to our friend, oh, you need to pray for so-and-so because she is really alive. Oh, yes. and, and that's why if we are afraid, we were never afraid of confessing to the priest, whether it was wrong or the other things. Because he will go to bed, but he will not confess your sins, so you were safe. No, you're safe. But here I have here so many times, oh, you know, poor thing, did this one. Blah. Bless her heart. And uh, then I get, <laughs> yeah. And idea that I did it, she's saying that kind of way, say, bless her heart. Exactly. And you know what? Let me tell you guys, if somebody confesses a sin to you and shares something with you in confidence and you tell somebody else, right. that is a horrible sin. You have violated the trust of a brother or sister, and God is not happy with you if you do that. Don't ever take that lightly. I don't care how much pleasure you take in gossip. If you ever do that, if somebody shares a confidence with you, especially if they share a sin with you as a way to try to find healing, and you tell somebody else, you better get ready to get on your knees and ask for forgiveness, because that's a serious, serious sin. First rich, and then you get the Oh, I was going to ask the benefit of confessing your sin, but I see it. It's your healed. Yeah, exactly. Come, healing comes from that. And that's the testimony. Again, in, in, uh, in Foster's book, he talks about the healing that can come from that process. 
There is something about articulating and getting it out there. It's a way. See, one of the biggest things that keeps us from being forgiven of sin, uh, forgiven from our sins, is that we, or you know, not not feeling the release of uh, forgiveness, is that we won't really admit we have it. We won't really acknowledge our own sin, even to ourselves. Well, when we go to another brother or sister and we confess our sins to them, there's no more evidence. There's, there's no more obvious way that we are acknowledging our own sin and laying it before the Lord. As we lay it before our brother or sister, we're laying it before the Lord so that we can be healed from it. And we can be forgiven of that and cleansed of it. Again, there is forgiveness for us anyway. But the idea of being cleansed and released from the burden of that can happen when we present that sin to a brother or sister. Ron? Uh, I was thinking of the structure like uh, um, brothers and sisters who have uh, worked and proved themselves like the deacons. Yep. Would it be not exactly a job description, but could a person maybe go to a deacon or yeah. somebody like that? I, I feel pretty comfortable going to these people that are really... Well, I think we have great elders and I think we have great deacons. Yeah. Um, there's still people and there's some who probably have greater maturity than others. And maturity is really the issue. Whether they can receive something, respond appropriately to it, keep it in confidence. And you really need to prayerfully make that call for yourselves. Anything else about confession or about anything else we've talked about today? Because we're coming to the end of our time. Bill? Well, the only thing, and Foster points this out, too often we think we're a fellowship of sinners, I mean of saints. Oh yeah. Instead of admitting... We're all a fellowship of sinners. Yep, there's a high priority in looking good because we think that will make us good in some way. Then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor of the church. I'm not supposed to be evidently a sinner. Well, folks, I am. Okay? We all are. Um, and yet we have to recognize that, that it is a hospital for sinners, you know, not a hotel for saints. And that we are all fallen before the Lord, and by His grace only are we redeemed. And so we need to confess that, we need to recognize that, and not feel like there has to be some pretense that we're as close to perfect as you can get and still be on this side of glory, because we're not. And part of that is recognizing our own sins and being willing to confess them. I mean, it's kind of the chain. You recognize it, then you can confess it. Perhaps you can repent from it. Yeah. Perhaps you can make restitution. You know what? Yep. Can I say another thing? Sure. The time that you use to confess is too short. Okay. The silent, the moments of silence. So you have a lot more sense of that. Yeah, than that. Uh, <laughs> they don't see it there. <laughs> then I well, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to reflect. It doesn't. Yeah. No, yeah. and actually, and I want us to, to open that up. Yeah. We, need to, we need to give it more time. So. It's uncomfortable, but maybe that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, you know what? Being uncomfortable may very well be the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Yeah. That when we find discomfort in something like that, it might exactly be because that's what we need. Mm -hmm. And that the Spirit is causing us to feel that, okay, something's going on here. Uh, as, I've, uh, as we've talked about before, the, the idea of guilt, you know, I've heard so many people say in Christian organizations and even churches, oh, we don't want anybody to feel guilty. Mm -hmm. Well, my response is, well, why not? We There's a Christian word for guilt. The word conviction. Is the, all that is is a Christian word for guilt. And conviction, actually, Scripture says, to, to point out guilt to people is part of the job of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's not my job to draw up guilt, but if given the realities of a worship situation, if the Holy Spirit is causing someone to feel conviction or guilt in their heart, I'm not supposed to try to take that away from them. I need to let the Holy Spirit speak to them, to their hearts, and let them respond to that. Okay? So there's not something inherently wrong with that being the point. The old guy said, the reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty. Yeah, it's the reason you feel guilty. I had a TV show recently, and um, there was a family, and somebody said to, to the one woman, said, you always act so much better than us. And she said, that's because I am so much better than you. You know, I, I, I haven't slept with anybody else's husband. I have a job. I have not robbed any banks, you know, which is some of the things all the rest of you have. So, yeah, sometimes... People feel bad, like, oh, well, you're acting better than me. Well, yeah, because I've done things I shouldn't have done, and I need to feel guilty about that. So. Let me close in prayer, and we will go for the day.